Well, I want to welcome you today. I'm very excited about our program. We have a very special guest, and her name is Nancy Cowie. She's a missionary to South Africa and is back in the United States on, on a furlough. And so I just wanted to introduce at this time Nancy. So good to have you with us here today. And you know, what a blessing you are as I think about your faith and your life as a Christian and, and your good work as a missionary in South Africa. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with you and be back in my home country and my home state. So. Yeah. Well, I thought maybe today as we get started, I would, you know, just read a couple of verses from Acts uh, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power from the Holy Spirit mm. when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so as I think about being here in the Midwest, that I would say that you are certainly one who is being a witness, being about God's work and mission to the ends of the earth, to, <laughs> to South Africa. And, I don't know, uh, Nancy, I should just share with you, and maybe you're going to find this to be a little bit on the funny side, but when I was growing up, my father was a pastor, and he was so interested in missions, and I think that's maybe why, you know, I'm kind of interested in, you know, very interested in missions today, but being that, you know, he was a pastor, and he would always be getting our congregation interested in mission work, and he would have missionaries come to our church, and they would be giving programs in the evening, and speaking on Sunday morning, it seems like we would have missionaries from New Guinea. And I also remember this one missionary that was from India. And what impressed me about this missionary from India is that, you know, as a little kid, he was sharing with me that when he was a kid, he, it was at night and he was down by this lake and he saw, well, this Ooh. snake. And so he jumped on it, you know, thinking that it was just like this water snake. Well, here it was a cobra. <gasps> And here he ended up killing a, a cobra, but I, you know, as a little kid, I was just so impressed by that. And so I don't know what it is in South Africa. I don't know if you've killed a man-eating lion or anything like that, but what would get us all excited about mission work this day? You know, but, you know, you think about South Africa, and we think about Africa and just how beautiful it is. And, and you know, if you're taking a trip to South Africa, probably mm. one of the things would be to see the animals. Mm. Are, do you have a lot of animals in South Africa that you can take a look at or just well, certain areas? I mean, they're not probably not crawling in your backyard uh, or anything like that. But. Yeah, uh, we uh, live in the Western Cape area of South Africa, which is um, more southern. And the animals in that area ha were hunted out uh, pretty much about 80, 90 years ago. So unfortunately, in our area, uh, people, I, when they visit, they always think, I'm going to get off the plane, and where is the elephant? Where is the giraffe? And it's going to be right there at the at the door to meet them, but that doesn't happen. Um, but there are many places in South Africa, particularly more northern, that you can go and see the animals. And they, of course, are spectacular in God's creation. And uh, one of the beautiful things about that country is they're, they're incredible animals. And, and of course, they're incredible people. Is the variety of animals is large. Also, South Africa has, as it's, it is called, the Rainbow Nation. It has an incredible array of people, and that's one of both the challenges and the joys of being a missionary in South Africa. But they're not all the same. That's right. Everybody is mm -hmm. different and has, just like animals, have their own unique way of, of doing things and mm -hmm. you know, habits and uh, techniques and the way that they talk and communicate. And so, again, it makes it very interesting and uh, alive and also challenging to be a missionary there. Yeah. So now, you grew up here in the United States. So was there a certain town or place where you primarily grew up? Where, where did yeah. you grow up here I, in the United States? I uh, pretty much grew up in uh, Platteville, Wisconsin, a small community outside of Madison. And that's where most of my growing up years were. And then I um, ended up moving to Chicago. And uh, while I was in Chicago, um, uh, working there, actually living in southern Chicago, Gary, Indiana, that actually the Lord started to speak to me. I was 33 years old at that stage, and the Lord started to speak to me about who he was, that he was love and forgiveness. And I was actually came to know Jesus as my Savior in Gary, Indiana, when I was 33. And um, as it relates to my mission story, 
Uh, the community I lived in was primarily what you would call here a black community. So I went to a black church. That's where I accepted Christ in a black church. I was one of the only white members of about a 2,000 person black church. So part of my story is that, you know, God is always working upstream in our life. He's always preparing us if we're watching in advance for that work that he has for us to do. So I, I can tell when I look back now and where I'm ministering now that he prepared me by bringing me to that congregation and, and having me be a part of that congregation because I work with a tremendous group of primarily tribal people uh, in South Africa. Yeah, so Gary, Indiana. Yeah. And so it was this church where you really had a lot of faith formation. And it's there. Well, and I should also mention that, you know, you're back home from, you know, just on what do you call furlough. Uh-huh, yes. And, but to also mention that you have your husband, Reg. Uh-huh. Reg, who I've met, just a wonderful guy. But yes. he's also serving with you, and, and he's in South Africa, That's meaning correct. that he didn't come back this time. That's right. That's right. As if I remember, last year he came back and you stayed. Okay, so now, is that kind of the church, or, or, or share where, okay, as far as when you started feeling this call, right. where God is calling you to be a missionary to South Africa, I mean, how does that come about? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting because um, I was not married at that point in my life, and I ended up moving to Tucson, Arizona, and in Tucson, uh, I w went to college and uh, night school, and I met my husband there, and it happens that my husband, Reg, his father and his father's family are South African. So he did not grow up in South Africa, but he grew up hearing all the stories of South Africa and had gone to visit a few times. But his father um, came and was trained in America. And when he was trained, he met my husband's uh, mom uh, from Tennessee and brought her to South Africa. And then uh, when apartheid was in its uh, really in the main days of apartheid they felt uncomfortable living in South Africa so my husband was actually conceived in South Africa but born in America and so he didn't grow up with the culture but he grew up with the stories and when we got married in Arizona he told me someday I'm going to bring you to South Africa and so we decided to to go one day to meet a great aunt and while we were in South Africa uh, we felt just an incredible connection in the country and we were going through Kruger Park which was is where all the animals are located and we ended up having an opportunity to minister to the local people in the park they came and they asked for prayer and as we prayed for them um, there was a true moving of the Holy Spirit we did not go to do that kind of work we actually went with a group of unrelated 21 unrelated people from different churches. We went to go on safari and then visit the aunt. And God really moved in that situation. And in fact, uh, from that, there is a church planted in every uh, camp in that park that uh, our group helped to start. So we knew we were called to South Africa, but we had no idea how we were going to get, get there. We came back home or get back there. We came back home, and at that time, I was on pastoral staff at my church in California, our church, and um, my husband worked for what is now AT&T. So we had to seek God during that time, and I think it's one of the lessons of, of a calling, is that you may have a calling. That doesn't mean immediately you go buy your airline ticket or you go, you can make your calling happen. You can, you can by yourself take it upon yourself, but... Uh, we believed that God had to show us every step of the way. We had to be prepared and ready. And it took another five years before God had us prepared, uh, brought us to the place where we were really uh, in a spot. Uh, and we were now in our mid, later 40s, 46 and 47, um, to actually make, you know, quit our jobs, sell all of our belongings, and actually move to South Africa. My husband went on a small mission trip and while he was there in 2005, uh, he said, I, instead of going back to Kruger, he said, I think we are supposed to go to the Western Cape. So we went on another little fact-finding trip and then we ended up in November of 2005 actually moving to South Africa. Wow, what a journey. Isn't that something? Yeah, it's... it's it, you know, you read in the, you know, we read in the Bible about Jesus calling people yeah, you know, like they just leave their nets and there they go, or you encourage people to sell all that they have, come and follow me, and, and some did. 
I mean, you just think about that as being such a big step of faith. And it's almost like you're, you've written another chapter of the book of Acts. You know, like God has called you and here you go. And it's almost like you could write that, you know, that 29th chapter here uh -huh. to say, well, here's the 29th chapter of Acts as the Holy Spirit has called us mm. and in all of your experiences there. And so, you know, you, and so when you think about, okay, the connection to South Africa, but then also your church. Your church also is pretty instrumental and in yes. really kind of helping you. You know, as God gave you the vision to say, well, mm -hmm. this is for the two. This is the vision for the two of you. But really, it's because ministry. Yeah, it's it's you and Reg. But really, it's a lot of people who are That's involved right. and behind this. That's whole right. Effort. It's 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 really about the body working together. And uh, Reg and I were a part of the same church in California for ten years. That church was a very small church. And then, as the years went on and it grew, we got to know all the people in the church, and we became for our church their first missionaries. And so. Uh, it was like a big, a huge family of people. From we grew to about a thousand people, so we knew all these people mm -hmm. as they kept coming, and they knew us and they supported us. And as the time came for us to say, we think God is leading us. Now that there was that five-year period that we were praying, and they were praying with us, and you know we said, should we do this? And and uh, we're not super Christians. I just want to say, you know, missionaries are not super Christians. We're like anybody who has questions about is this did I really hear right is it is it really the right thing to do how can I leave my family how can I leave my friends uh, my husband had a good job how do you leave your 401ks and your investment <laughs> things you know the world is the is there you're living in it and we're supposed to uh, sort of be foreigners in it but certainly we have the questions anybody had and our church community came around us prayed with us confirmed to us that they felt that we should go and of course they are they sent us they're our sending church so um, missions never happens in a vacuum it's not about one people and in fact we felt like Abraham God said you know go he didn't tell them him exactly where he was going to go or even what he was going to do his job description he just said go and he promised him that he was going to be the father of, of nations and we know that the Abrahamic covenant is about going and, and being blessed, but being blessed to bless the nations. So many of our friends said, well, okay, what are you going to do there? What, what's your job description? Um, you know, exactly what do your days look like? Well, we, we really couldn't answer that question. We said, well, we're going to the, the Western Cape. Uh, the, the community is called Parl, and we're going there, and we're working with a mission organization there that was a non-denominational organization that primarily focused on children and communities. And we said, we're not sure what we're going to do when, when we get there. And when we did get there, uh, again, now we're in our late 40s, um, uh, our mission organization had a coffee shop, and, um, and they were working in the local tribal community the, with, that has a lot of Tosas and Zulus. And, um, and they said, first, we want you to serve in our coffee shop. And we also want you to come and do uh, the little Bible study with our children in the, in the townships. Um, so to go from being, I want to say, established in a community or with a group of people to a place where you don't know anybody and you're working in an, a coffee shop with Afrikaans, that's the white community, and then you're going into this very poor, poor area working with kids who don't know English and who know Tosa or who know a little bit of Zulu. Um, but very little English. Um, th as a missionary, that really rocks your world. Let me just put it that way. You're learning all these new cultures, and really, most of the people you work with uh, could care less if you were a rocket scientist. You know, and you're, they really don't know anything about you. All they know is that you're here, and they're watching how you serve them. So we, in, in return in serving them, are, are trying to understand them as a culture and a community. So one of the stories is, as we came to the coffee shop, my husband uh, was in the kitchen and I was waiting tables, which I hadn't done for 30 years. Um, and I kept bringing water out to them because in America you put water on the table. Finally, the third day they said, Nancy, what are you doing? I said, well, bringing water. They said, no, no, we, in our culture, we drink sop, which is juice. So you don't never bring water out to, to people. And so it was those little cultural things that we started to 
learn about in that beginning stage of our work there. Um, so it's important as a missionary when you when you leave your culture, you have to understand that you're not there coming into a culture to bring your culture to it. You are actually there to be changed to to their culture and to help represent Christ in a way that they can hear in their culture. Well, I really appreciate that because that's one of the criticisms that I've heard you know, from worldly people mm. is that Christian missionaries, they go into countries and they have no respect for their culture and who they are, but they're just there to change them into, for instance, mm. Western culture as that's an right. example. But you really have to be sensitive and, and to be working, rather trying to be indigenous to the culture that you are, are yeah. serving. And that's got to be, I would think that, you know, that that would be, you know, quite a delicate uh, yes. work there to, to yeah. say, well, we're, to try to, because cultures, we just uh, can't assume that they're going right. to think and act that's and right. do just like we, what we do. I think what we also must remember is that in most missionary cases, the people are not asking you to come. You, you are feeling a call. They haven't necessarily felt the same call that some missionaries are going to come. And so you are inserting yourself in their, in their culture and in their lives. And, in, and that really takes delicacy. And I have to say that uh, there's, uh, when we talk about culture, and I do a lot of teaching on helping people to understand these cultural differences, that Americans are primarily an individualistic culture. We're all about us and what we can get and our decisions and our vote. And um, the groups of people we worked with primarily are not tribal people, or excuse me, are not individualistic. They are what we would call participative people. They make decisions as a group. They do what's best for the group. They have a tribal chief and what the tribal chief and elders decide is the decision for the whole culture. Um, they are not time sensitive. They are relationship sensitive. Whereas Americans, we are very productivity and time. It's all, you know, we show respect by being on time. In those cultures, it's not about time. In fact, they call it Africa time. Uh, and that is where uh, people, because they value the relationship, uh, they, will, they will go to a friend's house and talk with them. And if they're late for an appointment, it's because they were valuing a relationship and the person waiting will understand because it's all about the relationship. And, and when he gets to that next person, they will realize now he's spending my time with me. So this concept of, of time and of productivity and the idea that with the, there's 11 tribal cultures in South Africa, that, which takes up about 85% of the population. Then there is a, a, a colored community, which is Indians, and it's an accepted term there. The coloreds are anybody who's not white and not tribal. Um, so if you're a, if a mixed, you know, from a white mom or dad and black mom or dad, then you are a colored person. So they make up about uh, uh, roughly, actually it's, it's about 70%, I think, tribal, about 15% of the colored, and then the rest are the white Afrikaners and English uh, people from England. So you've got this huge mix of people living very close to one another. I know we have this in the States, but it's a little different in this country because of the apartheid issues that happen. So it's like I say, like uh, there's sand in your shoes. There's constantly a rub. There's constantly these different cultures that have different values and what we called worldviews. They, how they grew up is very different. How they view life is very different. What's important to them is very different. And, so as a missionary, uh, you come in, as we came in, and you make mistakes, actually. You, 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 what we call, you step on landmines, cultural landmines, because you're not prepared always. And you can almost never be prepared for... Well, it's like for trying to learn things. all these different subcultures, really. That's right. I mean, it's just like we're not just going to South Africa and learning this culture, but really you're learning about a lot of different mm -hmm. That's cultures. Right. And, yeah, and right. you, mu you must be sensitive to those things. And in fact... Um, uh, one of the things we realized as we were working with the youth is that, uh, and kids, is that um, well, they love to have us there. And, and we really would walk away saying, gosh, did they get anything out of that Bible study? And what we realized is it is a ministry of presence, you being there, you loving them. And, and God told my husband and I, who we don't have children, we were working with children. He said, if you can express who I am, who Jesus is, to a child who does not know your language, 
So in essence, without words, through love, then you can express me to anybody. And so that was a profound learning for us, that it wasn't about how great we knew our Bible or how wonderful verses we had uh, or how well we taught. It was about loving them, being with them. And then through children, I think we know this, you reach their parents, you start to speak to their parents. So we started then working within the families, within these communities. Um, but I noticed that the men would never talk to me or very rarely talk to me. So I would greet them, Molo Johnny, and they might nod, but where's the women and the children? Well, I, at that stage, was wearing pants, as many American women do. But in their culture, when a woman gets married, she never wears pants again. She always wears a dress or a skirt, and she always wears something on her head as a respect a sign of a respect for her husband and her husband's family and to, to show that she is a married woman. So I changed and started to always wear a dress or a skirt when I worked in the communities and immediately the men started to respond to me in a way of saying, oh now you know our culture, now you understand that you're, you're a married woman and you're supposed to have a, you're supposed to have, be covered and have a dress on and um, and so it opened a whole new way for me to communicate. And that's one of the reasons I'm dressed the way I am today, because it's a respect thing that they would have uh, to be able to actually speak to them about anything, much less a spiritual thing. Uh, a woman must be dressed appropriately. So, so those there are, are some of our cultural lessons. cultural things that you have to learn. And yeah. Yeah, so, and so the hat is called what? It's a, it's a Zulu hat, mm -hmm. this hat. And the Zulu hats, uh, the... the African people, I think, love uh, um, headdresses and they love beads and, you know, they, they love um, showing off their culture through uh, these kinds of things. They used to make this type of a hat out of feathers and, and actually have feathers up and pointing out. And then as time went on, it, it condensed to being a fabric hat. And it's made like in a shape of a bowl. Mm -hmm. And so this particular shape, actually, they have used to make stadiums out of. So the stadium in Cape Town looks like this hat, if you were to see a picture of it. Um, these hats are primarily used for dress occasions, whereas in, on non-dress occasions, they would use beads and, and other types of things. And, so, and the beads are made out of paper. They take uh, magazine paper and cut it in long strips and roll it up and cure it and then, and then bead it together. And so, yeah, so as I said, it's a, just one of the things, I think as a Christian, uh, what I have grown to understand is that as you become a missionary, what a missionary means is giving up yourself to be able to embrace another group of people. You have to die to yourself. You have to, you know, uh, we have many um, uh, people who come on short team trips and we have to start talking to them about don't bring your laptops and don't bring your, you know, all of your gadgetry and, you know, you might need to uh, bring a skirt and take, so it's about not about you as an individual now. It's about you being able to represent to them Christ in a way that they can accept it, that they can they cannot be caught up by what you're wearing or not wearing. or um, they, they know that you took the time to respect their culture, which means you respect them by following their traditions and, and their... So it's a process of, of becoming less and less so that you can... Um, become more of Christ to them mm -hmm. through the reflection of their culture and norms. Less and less so you can have you know, more and more of Christ yeah. and more and more as far as who they are. So that must take you know, a lot of time just as far as the groundwork and just establishing uh, trust and relationships. And once you've done mm -hmm. that, and, and so now you've been well in South Africa for... It's been eight years. Eight years. And so... And I know that your ministry there has multi, it's multifaceted. I mean, you've done, I can know you've done some prison ministry, yes. but then there's been also some, why don't you share the different sure. facets of your ministry? That you... yeah, I'd be glad to. We, we have three different facets, and those facets are primarily, one is, is prison ministry, and my husband almost immediately after working with children got involved with mm -hmm. prisoners. And he never did that work in the States. Uh, in the States, we were you know, part of a small group, and we did ministry in our church, but that was never his focus. But there, for some reason, he went to a prison, and it just, uh, you know, what, it just connected with his passion. And so we work with the Andrew Murray Center for Prison Ministry. Uh, Andrew Murray was a very famous evangelism in our community. 
Um, and we work now in about eight prisons with about 3,000 prisoners, and we work not just with the prisoner. Uh, we, we do a fantastic program called Restorative Justice, where we try to work with prisoners to understand the effect of their crimes and how those crimes affected their family and victims and uh, move them to a place of, um, ex of them coming to own their crime and then being able to minister out of that and create relationships. Um, then we have secondarily is uh, we do a lot of training and educating and so I do a lot of training and educating myself with people who want to become missionaries and talk to them about cultural differences and how they might come and work in communities more effectively and then we do a lot of community work itself where we work within communities we try to bring and bridge communities together so we try to get our white South Africans to come together with our close friends and, and do let's say paint a uh, 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 an orphanage or paint a school. Mm -hmm. So those are the three main areas we work in. Yeah, and so a very, they have a very Christ-centered ministry and they're reaching out and and so just in the little time that we have, I know that there are you know, needs and that you certainly want prayer support. Financial support mm -hmm. always can help too. So I'm just wondering if you want to support the colleagues, what's the best way to do that? Is there a you know, some website or address that we could... You, you can always see the part of our work that's prison ministry. You can see that uh, by looking up the Andrew Murray Center. Um, Andrew, just as it sounds, Murray, M-U-R-R-A-Y Center. You can Google that, and we do have a site that gives you that information. Our ministry itself is called Passion for Africa. That encompasses everything we do. We don't have a website, but we do send out a blog and keep people updated uh, with a brochure that we have, uh, which we're happy to send out to you so you would know more about what we do. And if you wanted to send us information uh, or, or contact us, I think the best is at my email address, which is nancylkowie at gmail.com. So it's quite easy, nancylkowie at gmail.com. Yeah. Well, Nancy, you're such a blessing. You're such a blessing to us, such a blessing to the people of South Africa. And we just uh, thank you so much for taking the time today to be with us. And I just want to thank all of you for joining us today as well. Mm -hmm.